Well, good evening. It's, uh, it's such a blessing to be here. Uh, I am honored to uh, stand and share this moment with you, and uh, I'm always excited whenever I get an opportunity to come here in Greenwich, and, uh, as, you know, always exciting when I'm in the company of uh, our wonderful pastors. Um, I know Pastor Faith and Pastor Glenn are away, but Pastor Nick, why don't we give him a hand? Pastor Nick. <laughs> So I always look forward to these opportunities um, just to be with them and because since most of my ministry time is in Stanford, so uh, I don't get to come here too often, but I'm uh, glad to be here. And uh, of course, it goes without saying, I am honored to share uh, God's word tonight. So let's get started. Why don't we go to Psalm 25. Um, Psalm 25, that's where we'll camp out tonight. And I want to talk to you on the topic of divine direction, divine direction. Everybody say with me, divine direction. Awesome. Psalm 25. It reads like this. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net." Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Well, let me ask you a question tonight. How many decisions do you think you make in a day? How many decisions do you think you make in a day? 30, 50, 70, 100? A professor at the University of Minnesota decided to research decision-making, and he found that every day, he found that on the low end, people who are sort of indecisive make about 300 decisions a day. That's right, 300. And then there are those decision-making machines, right? Perhaps because of their personality, because of their job, because of their position, those people make, on average, about 2,000 decisions a day. It's a lot of decisions, right? So if you do the math, if you live to be about 80 years old, then that comes out to about between 9 million to half a billion decisions in your lifetime. It's a lot of decisions. You made a decision to come to church tonight. You decided 
on what to wear, right? You decided what to eat before church tonight. Some of you haven't eaten dinner yet, and you're thinking about that right now, right? Some of you are in the process of making some real serious decisions in life, like who to marry, right? Where are you going to buy your next home, right? Um, what major are you going to choose in college? Those are some big decisions. And then there are those not so serious decisions like where you're going to spend your weekend, right? With whom you're going to spend uh, your weekend. Even right now, you're, you're actively making a decision to listen or to not listen, right? Someone once said, life is the sum of all choices, and we make hundreds of big and small decisions every day. Some of these decisions are opportunities that can change your life. Some are big decisions which are often difficult to make, and sometimes you're forced to make them and live with the consequences, right? Some decisions are not hard at all, right? Like what you're going to wear to work tomorrow. Well, it depends on who you ask, right? So we all make hundreds of decisions every day. And over a lifetime, thousands, hundreds and thousands of decisions over a lifetime. But here's the most important question. Ready for this? What's your hit rate? What's your hit rate? In other words, how many decisions, right, what percentage of the decisions you make are good decisions or right decisions. What's your hit rate? 50%? 70%? 10%? You may not always know the outcome of your decisions right away. Sometimes you'll never know. The fact of the matter is that life is composed of a series of decisions. Wouldn't you agree with me? Right? And most times, every decision we make not only affects us, but the people around us, which is why it's important to have a plan, have a strategy, right, on, on how to make wise decisions. And if life is made up of an infinite amount of choices, and if your success to some extent depends on your choices, then what better way than to get guidance from God on what decisions you need to make? King David, the author of this psalm, understood the importance, the significance of decision-making. He was this great king of Israel, right? The United Kingdom of Israel. And he probably had a ton of advisors, but he knew that ultimately he needed to depend on God for every decision. Whether it be big or small, he needed to rely on God for everything. And he illustrates this desire, his heart's desire through this beautiful psalm. It's in the form of a prayer. Um, it's him asking the Lord to teach him his ways. Psalm 25 is considered... An acrostic psalm, which means each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 verses in the psalm, uh, in the Hebrew alphabet. And notice there are 22 verses in the psalm. In the Hebrew, you'll find that each verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the main reason why the psalmist chose this form was to help people memorize it, right? He didn't just, this is not a, a journal entry, a random journal entry, okay? This is, this is it's, it's truly beautiful how it's structured. And this goes along the Psalms theme of learning or instruction, and it fits with the alphabetical arrangement. David prays for the Lord to teach him his ways. The Psalm is all about getting guidance, getting direction from God for our personal lives, for our situations, for our families. And I want us to consider the question tonight, which some of you often ask in your prayers. You often ask God, which way is the right way to go, right? You often ask that, right? All of us have prayed that prayer at some point. All of us have been in situations where we've asked God, God, please show me. Show me something. 
Give me a proof. Give me a sign of some sort. I need to know before I take this next step. I need to know. I, in fact, I don't even know what decision to make. I need you to tell me. I need you to reveal to me what you would like for me to do. Some of you are taking some time out this summer. You know, that's what I love about the summer. You know, when you take vacation, it, it, it's, it's not only you're having fun, but also it's a time of reflection, right? I was at a beach just uh, last month, and yes, I was enjoying everything on the beach, but I was also just, just reflecting on, on the year and, and, and how far I've come and we have come as a family and just thinking about some of these things. And you're in that right now. You're, you're thinking through some things, and, and you want to make some, there's some complex decisions that are very important for your lives, and perhaps some decisions are robbing you of your sleep and keep you second-guessing. And when you think about it, this is, this is one of the main causes of stress in our lives, right? right? When, you, when you reach these decision points, those major decision points, and it just, it just it causes so much stress. And, and people say, you know, stay away from those big decisions. Now, don't make those big decisions when you're stressed, but sometimes you don't have a choice. Right? You don't have a choice. So you cry out and say, God, what do I do? Please help me. I think the more important question that we as Christians can ask ourselves when we reach a decision point is, how do we know God wants in those situations? Or how do we know what God wants in those situations? How do we know? Does he give us some warm, serene feeling of, of peace when we think about the right decision? Perhaps some strange sign. I remember, I remember the first time, for the first time, when I was getting really serious about uh, listening to God or, or hearing from him, hearing, hearing his voice. Uh, I was perhaps maybe 10 or 11 at the time. I went to, a, uh, went to my room and I sat down on the floor. I took the Bible. Uh, I, 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 I put it in my lap and I, and I just made myself believe because I said to myself, I am going to open the Bible, right? And, and wherever, whatever scripture portion I land, right, that is God's specific word for me. Don't look at me like you've never done that before, right? You do that every single day, some of you. And I remember sitting on the floor, opened God's word, and I went, this doesn't make any sense. Let's try this again. I did that a second time. It's like, what? What is this? I kept trying, right? I did that so many times until I was, I found, I landed on a scripture portion that I was satisfied with. And that was me speaking to me. You want God to speak to you in your own way. And, and, and all of us are after signs. We want proof. Listen, all of God's word is inspired that can change your life, but sometimes we, we go so hard after proof and sign, like, you, you know, you want God to show something, right? Like, God, like, I'm going to go to the mall and, and just, if I find an op open, empty parking spot, that's you speaking to me, right? You're opening a way for me, a door for me, an avenue for me, whatever. Tonight, I want to give you a different perspective. I want to acquaint you with the psalm because this psalm is all about how God guides. It's not about how we think he guides or how he's supposed to guide us by giving us these, you know, proof and signs. But this psalm is all about how he guides us. And I want to point out something. I want to caution you by saying that many of us have turned the will of God into an idol. And too often we want to know the will of God more than we want to know God himself. We think that finding the will of God will remove uncertainty and help us achieve our dreams. You see, the Bible does talk about God's guidance in our lives, but it puts much more emphasis on knowing and trusting God and becoming the kind of person God wants you to be rather than looking for some mystical guidance. In fact, here's the big idea. Here's the key, and I want you to write this down. The question is not how God guides. The question is, 
whom God guides. Are you the type of person that God guides? Are you the kind of person that he guides? You see, the guidance David trusts God for in this psalm touches on a lot of different things. For example, in verse 15, David trusts God to keep him from disaster, to keep his feet from tripping in the net. In verse 17, he trusts God to guide him through the things that are bringing him stress. We see David trusting guidance over every inch of his life. For every decision, he's depending on God. There are some incredible promises here. This begs the question, what do I have to do to experience this kind of guidance? Remember, the question in this psalm is not how God guides, but whom God guides. What kind of a person receives guidance from God? I'm going to give you two things tonight. Two characteristics. Write these down. Number one, God leads all those who trust him. God leads all those who trust him. You see David's, we see David's confidence in the Lord when he says in verse 1, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust you. I love the way this is even structured. I mean, he talks about all his fears and insecurities later, but in the beginning he establishes the most important thing. Right off the bat he says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. And then he starts talking about all his problems. David, in essence, he's saying that he's completely handing his life over to God. David is lifting up his life to God because he has that much confidence in him. I wonder how much confidence we have in God. I wonder how much confidence we have in the promises of God. After all, we're all decision makers. We're making decisions all day, every day. Our life is a series of choices. Are we trusting God for everything? Are we going to God for all our decisions? Especially those big and complex decisions. Let me suggest to you that this is the trust that God is looking for in his followers to exhibit. Being a disciple of Jesus is about completely giving your life into the hands of God. This is what Jesus was alluding to when he said, when he's talked about forsaking all to follow after him. And David does just that. This was a decision that David made. A, a mental decision. He said, he said to himself, I'm going to trust God. I know I have all these people, I have all the resources in the world, but I am going to trust God. He made the choice that he was going to leave things in the hands of God and entrust his life to God. And because he did that, God blessed him. God blessed him. Let me ask you, are you the type of person that God guides? If, you, if, if not, then you may want to think about what changes you need to make in your life. It is my prayer that you would learn from David, from the psalm tonight. You see, David has tasted and seen that God, what God does for those who trust him, and that's why it says in verse 3, no one who trusts in you will ever be put to shame. Like, do you even believe that? When you read that, does it resonate? Do you trust God? David says, no one who trusts you will ever be put to shame. Do you really believe that in your heart of hearts? David is comparing those who put their trust in God with those who do not put their trust in God. Those who trust in God through faith will not be disappointed or let down. This, this verse doesn't mean you, you can call yourself a Christian and you will never be let down. Instead, it means when you humbly put your confidence in him, in God, as you wait actively on him, when you wait patiently, he will not let you down. Notice I said, wait actively. Because the word trust is an action verb. Waiting on God is active trust 
in him. Here David offers his prayer to God and puts his trust in God and asks God to teach him his ways. What an example of how to wait patiently. Put your trust in God and ask him to guide you along your path just as the scripture promises and you will not be disappointed. Amen? Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of the famous missionary Jim Elliot, they met at Wheaton College and they decided they were going to spend the rest of their lives in Ecuador in ministry, doing missions. And so right after engagement, they went to Ecuador and Jim was killed in 1956 while making attempt uh, ministry, uh, making attempt to make missionary contact with the Aka tribe. Years later, Elizabeth Elliot wrote in her book, God's Guidance, uh, a slow and certain light. Tells a story about when she was in the Amazon jungles. A couple of explorers from America came and, 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 and they, because she was so familiar with the place, they asked her to draw a map. And this is what she said. She said, you don't need a map here. What you need is a guide. They said, oh, no, we can make it. Don't worry about it. If you don't, don't want to do that, if you don't want to draw a map for us, don't worry about it. And she wrote in her book that she never saw them again. Maybe they made it or maybe not. The point, sometimes all we want is a map, but you would probably be overwhelmed and frustrated with a map. What you really need is a relationship with a guide. A relationship that is so constant. At every point, you get the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. At every point of frustration and confusion, the guide tells you what steps to take next. Friends, that's our God. That is our God. What you and I need is not a map, is not a sign, is not a proof, but we need him, his presence, his guidance in our life as our personal guide. David says in verse 9, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Friends, true humility is God consciousness. Humility keeps you focused on God and his ways, which then helps you to keep, put your trust in God as you look to him and depend on him for everything. Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? Kingdom of God. They shall inherit. That's a promise that humble people will receive everything. Such a person is satisfied. Listen, we don't want to be people that say, oh, I, I guess it will come all right. That's not trusting, friends. Just drifting recklessly with the tide is not trust. Neglect is not trust. Trust is something positive. It is something real, not a mere happen so or maybe so. It is a definite attitude of soul and mind, a realization of our own need and of God's sufficiency. It is the reaching out and anchoring ourselves in God. Trust isn't easy, but it is one of the most important parts of our relationship with God. When times are tough and things aren't going our way, then we find it the most difficult to trust him. But you know what? He wants us to trust him when we're having doubts and we're unsure about what to do. He wants us to believe in his promises when we think that things are not going to get worse. He wants us to truly believe that all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. See, the thing is that God, this is exact opposite of how God wants us to react to the difficult circumstances of our lives. When it gets tough, he wants you to trust him. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall what? Direct your path. 
So what kind of a person gets guidance from God? Number one, those who trust in him, those who trust in his promises. Who else? Write this down. God guides those who are trained in his ways. God guides those who trust in him, and God guides those who are trained in his ways. Look at what David says in verse 4. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. David is, is talking about an inward familiarity with the ways of God and that trains them on how to act. It's how athlete train. An athlete can't be instructed on exactly how to respond in every situation. The defense is always changing, but they can be trained on how to read situations and given the skills to respond accordingly. Michael Jordan probably one of the greatest greatest players uh, player to play the game of basketball. In one of his games, he did some, you know, some crazy move. He split the defense. He had like three people in front of him, and he split the defense, and he scored. And, and after the game, the reporters asked him, do you think about, like, what you're going to do? Like, when the defense, you know, they're, they're defending you, when they're in front of you, do you think about, like, what, you know, what move to make? And because it's, it looks so fancy. This is how Michael responded. He said, no, I don't. He said, I jump and I decide in the air. I jump and I decide. Those aren't planned moves. They are in the moment responses that come from skilled training. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about in the moment responses executed by someone who's been training. Here's how the New Testament talks about this. Listen to, listen to what it says in Hebrews 5. 13 and 14, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use, constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use, trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, refers to things perhaps not outlined in the Bible. You know, Scripture doesn't talk about drugs, right? But if you are trained in the Scripture, right, it can still give you the instinct to know God's perspective on it. Bible doesn't contain references to every evil that's out there, but if you are trained, then you know what God loves and know what God hates. I mean, isn't, isn't this what we want? You know, especially those of us who are parents, this is what we want for our children. Train our kids in, in the ways of God so they can distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. Because guess what? You're not going to know everything that they're exposed to. You're not going to know everything that they'll come in contact with. You're not going to know what's, everything that's out there, every form of evil. But if they are trained in the ways of God, that's all you can ask for. This, of course, applies to all of us as Christians. Again, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good. Constant use means so saturated in Scripture and skilled in its application that it becomes second nature. Let me illustrate it for you this way. In most sports, another sports analogy, in most sports there's an age sweet spot at which the combination of physical, technical, and strategic abilities come together. And that sweet spot is you're, you're, you're from your mid-20s to early 30s. In other words, there's a big difference when you try to play sports especially professionally when you're in your 20s versus when you play sports in your 40s. And it makes it more difficult when you're not training your body to play sports 
even just, you know, when you're playing just for fun. If you want to play sports and perform at a high level, when you're not in that, that sweet spot, then you've got to train harder, right? Let's say you're not in that age sweet spot and you try to play basketball, right? What happens is your, your mind knows what to do, what move to make, but your body won't obey. In your mind, you know what to do, but you look less like an athlete and more like someone coming in for a crash landing. Why? Because you're not trained through constant use. So here's your action step, friends. You need to get saturated in God's ways. How? through constant use. So saturated that you think in patterns of Scripture. You won't live out the will of God any more than you know the Word of God. Friends, do you realize that God wants us to know His ways? Do you believe that? I am moved to think that our Heavenly Father he loves us so much that He wants us to know, He wants us to know His ways. You know, Moses was once given an opportunity from God to ask whatever he wanted. And Moses said, I have, if I have found favor in your sight, then show me your ways. That's what he said. You know, that alone shows us that Moses was one of the greatest men in human history. All he wanted was to know God's ways. He could have asked for more power and authority. He could have asked for vengeance upon his stubborn following. He could have asked for anything, but he simply asked for, God, show me your ways. Here was his chance. He just wanted one, he just wanted one thing just wanted God's ways, to know God's ways. And you know what God did? He said, I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you something better than a sign. This was the better thing that God offered Moses. God promised Moses his presence. His presence. God replied to Moses' prayer, his request for a sign by saying, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I love the way that is connected. You don't have to stress about all the things that you're dealing with in life. If you trust me, if you know my ways, I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to go with you, I'm going to travel with you, I'm going to journey with you, and I'm going to give you the rest that you're looking for. God offered something better than guidance. He promised to be his guide. He promised to accompany Moses and his people and to be with them. This is what I love about our God. He's not someone who just lives in the heavenly domain and, and does whatever he wants, but rather a God who chose to come down and live among his people. Don't you want to live in God's presence? Guidance for a Christian comes from our ongoing relationship with God. That's it. Remember, it's not how God guides, but it's whom he guides. He wants us to know him, which means we have to know his ways. Being guided by him is part of that relationship. Just remember, signs are temporary, but relationships are permanent. Signs are temporary, but relationships are permanent. Signs can be misinterpreted. 
misread or not seen at all. God wants to lead us each step of our journey, not just in the big decisions of life, and he does that best by walking with us, right alongside us. It was this presence, this relationship that Moses experienced. It, it truly changed his life. One of the most telling indicators that of Moses' life is found in Exodus thirty-three eleven. The Lord spoke with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Think about that. This verse speaks to the reality and the depth of communion between Moses and God. Moses was God's friend, not because he was so skilled, not because he was a, this crazy, amazing leader. Yes, he was all of those things, but above all things, they were friends because Moses trusted his God. They talked to each other. They shared common interests. Moses never knew where he was going with God. God didn't always provide a signpost to direct him, but it didn't matter. Moses trusted God, and he trusted in God's promises, and he was trained in his ways, which, mean, which meant he knew with whom he was going. And that's all that mattered. Come on, stand with me all over this place. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and help me close. My prayer for us tonight as we go into a time of worship is that we would be consumed like never before. We would be consumed, every one of us, with knowing God. Knowing God. You see, when you embark on an adventure with God, you will learn that He is trustworthy, He is reliable, He is dependable. If, you, if that doesn't even make sense to you, then you haven't really tasted Him. And we can trust Him to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine according to the power that works in us. So tonight, I don't know what you're going through. There's probably a, you're probably at a decision point where you need to make some complicated, some big decision. There's things that you're dealing with in your family. There's with your spouse, in your marriage, things with your kids, health of a loved one, it might be school, whatever. As we go into a time of worship, I, I, I want you to, I want you to take a bold step and come right here in, in, fr in the front. And just, just come seeking God and His face. When you come, say, God, I want to know you. I want to know you more. I want to know you like never before. Teach me your ways like David prayed. Help me to trust in you. Can we do that tonight? I'm going to pray with you tonight right after the song. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus.